Brilliance Audio presents The Fault in Our Stars by John Green, performed by Kate Rudd. Late in the winter of my seventeenth year, my mother decided I was depressed, presumably because I rarely left the house, spent quite a lot of time in bed, read the same book over and over, ate infrequently, and devoted quite a bit of my abundant free time to thinking about death. Whenever you read a cancer booklet or a website or whatever, they always list depression among the side effects of cancer. But in fact, depression is not a side effect of cancer. Depression is a side effect of dying. Cancer is also a side effect of dying. Almost everything is, really. But my mom believed I required treatment, so she took me to see my regular Dr. Jim, who agreed that I was veritably swimming in a paralyzing and totally clinical depression and that therefore my meds should be adjusted and also I should attend a weekly support group. This support group featured a rotating cast of characters in various states of tumor-driven unwellness. Why did the cast rotate? A side effect of dying. The support group, of course, was depressing as hell. It met every Wednesday in the basement of a stone-walled Episcopal church shaped like a cross. We all sat in a circle right in the middle of the cross— where the two boards would have met, where the heart of Jesus would have been. I noticed this because Patrick, the support group leader and only person over 18 in the room, talked about the heart of Jesus every freaking meeting, all about how we, as young cancer survivors, were sitting right in Christ's very sacred heart and whatever. So here's how it went in God's heart. The six or seven or ten of us walked or wheeled in, grazed at a decrepit selection of cookies and lemonade, sat down in the circle of trust, and listened to Patrick recount for the thousandth time his depressingly miserable life story, how he had cancer in his balls and they thought he was going to die, but he didn't die, and now here he is, a full-grown adult in a church basement in the 137th nicest city in America, divorced, addicted to video games, mostly friendless, eking out a meager living by exploiting his cancer-tastic past, slowly working his way toward a master's degree that will not improve his career prospects, waiting, as we all do, for the sword of Damocles to give him the relief that he escaped lo those many years ago when cancer took both of his nuts but spared what only the most generous soul would call his life. And you too might be so lucky. Then we introduced ourselves. Name, age, diagnosis and how we're doing today. I'm Hazel, I'd say when they get to me. Sixteen. Thyroid originally, but with an impressive and long-settled satellite colony in my lungs, and I'm doing okay. Once we got around the circle, Patrick always asked if anyone wanted to share, and then began the circle jerk of support, everyone talking about fighting and battling and winning and shrinking and scanning. To be fair to Patrick, He let us talk about dying, too. But most of them weren't dying. Most would live into adulthood, as Patrick had. Which meant there was quite a lot of competitiveness about it, with everybody wanting to beat not only cancer itself, but also the other people in the room. Like, I realize that this is irrational, but when they tell you that you have, say, a 20% chance of living five years, the math kicks in and you figure that's one in five— So you look around and think, as any healthy person would, I gotta outlast four of these bastards. The only redeeming facet of support group was this kid named Isaac, a long-faced, skinny guy with straight blonde hair swept over one eye. And his eyes were the problem. He had some fantastically improbable eye cancer. One eye had been cut out when he was a kid, and now he wore the kind of thick glasses that made his eyes both the real one and the glass one, preternaturally huge. Like his whole head was basically just this fake eye and this real eye staring at you. From what I could gather on the rare occasions when Isaac shared with the group, a recurrence had placed his remaining eye in mortal peril. Isaac and I communicated almost exclusively through sighs. Each time someone discussed anti-cancer diets or snorting ground-up shark fin or whatever, he'd glance over at me and sigh ever so slightly. I'd shake my head microscopically and exhale in response.